This is the Beatles' most overtly political song, Revolution. And notice, John Lennon is wavering. Don't you know that you can count me out in? Thanks to copyright law, we can't play much of the actual song, sorry. But notice anything different in the lyrics of the single version? But when you talk about destruction, don't you know that you can count me out, period. End of sentence. By omitting that one little word, John was making a statement. A statement for peace and for liberty. Now, ladies and gentlemen, here are the Beatles. Lennon, whom some people associate with the far left, but comment below after watching if you think that's fair, was so passionate about this song that when his bandmates told him that first version was too slow to be released as a single, he insisted on re-recording it at a faster speed and higher volume. Like this. It was 1968, and the war in Vietnam, the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy, and the protests at the Democratic National Convention in Chicago made it seem like the world was becoming more violent. So John found himself at a crossroads. How did he feel about violence to achieve political goals? Now, he didn't waver at all on his thoughts toward Chairman Mao. But if you go Kennedy and fix it to Chairman Mao, you ain't gonna make it with anyone anyhow. But in the different versions of Revolution, Lenin struggles with, and eventually answers, an important personal dilemma. Count me out on violence. Period. End of sentence. Wars, protests, assassinations, they won't work. And sadly, his own assassination in 1980 proved him right. It didn't silence his music. In many ways, it amplified his legacy. Before he died, but after leaving the Beatles, Lenin would develop the anti-violence and anti-war message further in his solo work. Number two, taxes. A lot of the Beatles' influence was musical, some was technological, and a lot was philosophical. However, while they were fiercely protective of their non-political image earlier in the 60s, especially after Lennon's more popular than Jesus faux pas, if you know where to look, they showed leanings toward liberty. Their first outright political song was the kickoff to their 1966 album, Revolver. The band was at the height of its popularity and earning power. Lead guitarist George Harrison was also coming into his own as a songwriter and was fed up with the 95% super tax those in the UK's top tax bracket had to pay. Hence the lines coming from the tax man, There's one for you. 19 for me. Should 5% appear too small? Be thankful I don't take it all. Interestingly, the song even calls out two British politicians by name. Don't ask me what I That would be British Prime Minister Harold Wilson of the Labour Party, who instituted the super tax, and Ted Heath of the Conservative Party. And here not only is George coming out against high taxes, he's also making a crucial classical liberal point. That both the right and the left are two sides of the same penny. Every one of which George sarcastically recommends you'd better declare on your tax form. Number three, drugs and free speech. See if you can figure out the conspiracy theory that developed in 1967 when this was released. Lucy in the sky with diamonds. That's Lucy in the sky with diamonds. And what do the initials spell out? L-S-D. But Lennon swore until his dying day that Lucy wasn't code for lysergic and that diamonds wasn't code for diatilamide. 
Has it ever been settled whether Lucy in the sky with diamonds was a code for anything? It never was, and nobody believes me. I even saw uh, some famous star introducing, I've forgotten who it was, introducing a Lena McCartney show. And uh, it was Mel Torme mm. saying about how Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds is about LSD. This is the truth. My son came home with a drawing and said, showed me this strange looking woman flying around. I said, what is it? He said, it's Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds. And I thought, that's beautiful. I immediately wrote a song about it. Uh -huh. The song had gone out, the whole album had been published, and somebody noticed that, that the letters spelt out LSD. And I had no idea about it. And of course, after that, I was checking all the songs to see what the... The letters spelled out. Yeah. They didn't spell out anything, none of the others, and uh, it wasn't about that at all. You know? Now, John Lennon was a lot of things, but Shy wasn't one of them. In the opinion of this diehard Beatles fan, if the song had been about drugs, he not only would have admitted it, he'd have bragged about it. In fact, elsewhere on that same album, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, they had sung... Oh, I get by with a little help from my friends. Mm, I get high with a little help from my friends. Also this. And those lines got A Day in the Life and With a Little Help from My Friends banned on BBC Radio. So in one album, not only did the Beatles become icons for the freedom to use drugs, but they also became martyrs for freedom of speech. And though John's use of drugs at one point became abuse, his philosophy on them was pretty enlightened. If people are allowed to be completely free, it would let it would level out and people would be less inhibited and not be frightened of each other and wouldn't have to take drugs to prevent being hurt by each other. Here he's saying, let people use whatever drugs they want. If they figure out for themselves that they're harmful, that's a much more sustainable solution than banning them or a war on drugs. Ringo sure figured it out eventually. The sentiment of this next song is the sole reason I'm up here tonight. And it's called the No-No Song. Thank you. To recap so far, reasonable pro-human drug messaging anti-war messaging, anti-tax messaging. See my point? Well, another pillar of classical liberalism is of course freedom of movement, that is freedom of immigration, and a Paul McCartney rocker hints at the Beatles' position on that issue. See if this rhythm sounds familiar. We don't need Pakistanis, so you better travel home. It goes back to Enoch Powell, a member of British Parliament from the Conservative Party. His Rivers of Blood speech in 1968 turned him in to the leading figure of the anti-immigration movement and caused enough of a firestorm that the same Ted Heath from Taxman dismissed him from the shadow cabinet. So in early 1969, McCartney introduced a new song to the group. Its lyrics and the meaning of the song would change before its release, but the early lyrics satirized and protested, and that's crucial, it was a satire of Powell's anti-immigration position. It went, Living in the USA. After a long month of tweaking and rehearsing, the final version, performed at the famous Rooftop concert and released on the Let It Be album, is a little more subtle. All the girls around her say she's got it coming, but she gets it while she can. So here McCartney is presenting a transgender person, and he's foreseeing and lamenting the inevitable pushback she'll get from others, who tell her to well, get back. Well, get back to where you want. An underratedly great Beatles song is a George Harrison contribution to Rubber Soul from 1965. Again, at this stage in their development, they were largely apolitical, by design. Most of their songs were about romantic relationships, and so, Think For Yourself has often been interpreted through that lens. But in his autobiography, Harrison wrote that his target was narrow-minded thinking, and he identified the British government as a possible source of his frustration. You're telling your about the good things that we can have, 
if we close our eyes. Through that lens, the lyrics fit. It's the cry of an independent mind to politicians. Neurotic, psychotic, pig-headed politicians, as John called them in Give Me Some Truth, who promise everything but deliver nothing. I know you still can see. I know your mind's made up. Finally, even though it's not technically a Beatles song, we want to get your thoughts on this one. In the late 60s, George was writing a ton of great songs, but he couldn't really interest John and Paul in them, so he released them on his own after the breakup. His triple album, All Things Must Pass from 1970, is probably the high mark of Beatles solo work. One of the biggest hits on that album is My Sweet Lord, but it was also a hit to George's reputation. Because listen to this. The Shippins had recorded He's So Fine in 1963. What do you think? Can you hear the similarities? Harrison was sued and ultimately lost in court, found guilty of subconscious plagiarism. Now, whatever your thoughts about intellectual property law, and let us know those thoughts in the comments below, it's hard to see how any new songs could be written without at least some prior influence. So if this subconscious standard were applied broadly, it would be bad for music consumers and disincentivize musical innovation. I mean, can you imagine if modern bands were prohibited from subconscious influence from the Beatles? Due to copyright restrictions, this video has featured Tom Petty, Elton John, and Sarah Vaughan, among others, playing YouTube licensed cover versions of songs by the Beatles. So clearly the Beatles have been subconsciously plagiarized and profited from too. Though ultimately unsuccessful, Harrison's fight in court, which included acknowledging that he had actually been inspired by Oh Happy Day by the Edwin Hawkins singers, raised those points. Oh happy day, oh, happy day. when Jesus walked. Oh, when... I don't feel guilty or bad about it, Harrison later wrote, and he had no reason to. I know the motive behind writing the song in the first place, and its effect far exceeded the legal hassle. So those are six moments suggesting the Beatles might have been more pro-liberty than we thought. And again, we'd have loved to play the full original songs, but you know, copyright laws and all. 